Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Metzger, Assistant Curator of Botany at the Royal Ontario Museum and Curator of the exhibition which we are discussing today. I'm delighted you could join us for today's Curator Conversation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. Today's program highlights a unique ROM original exhibition, Florals, Desire and Design, on display until September 2021. It focuses on the 18th century, a time in Europe when botany arose as a science separate from medicine, that plants exchanged from around the globe were received as precious gifts. Highlighting botany's connection to the art and culture of the era, Florals invites visitors to discover this explosive period of botanical fascination and interest, during which art, culture, and nature were inextricably linked. In a moment, we will broadcast a pre recorded conversation between myself and Ron Near, Curator of Global Flat Fashion and Textiles, Dr. Alexandra Palmer, who assisted with this exhibition and is here with me today. Hi, Alexandra. It's great to see you. And uh, it's good to have an opportunity to talk a bit about uh, the florals and the connection of plants and fashion uh, this afternoon. No, it's really nice, Deb, and it's always a pleasure working with you as we've done over the years. And um, we often get Deb up into textiles to help us uh, tell us what we're looking at, what the flowers are. So um, we've spoken about the role of natural historians and, and trade, and your exhibition talks about that. So what were they looking for and what did they expect to find when they were going out into the world in the 18th century and, of course, before? And, and what did they do with all these extraordinary things once they got their hands on them? So, surgeon botanists were very much a part of the teams that were going out exploring the world, mostly for trade missions, uh, the East India companies and other things. And they were looking for any, any economically important plants and they would bring them back. And of course, new technologies were allowing them to be able to grow them. So in this image of the Chelsea Physic Garden, this was one of the very important gardens of the 18th century. It was in London on the Thames, and you can see the fashionable people at the bottom of, of the image uh, of this beautiful etching. And it's divided into sections, and each of the sections is for a different purpose, keeping the tender plants, hothouses, bark houses, um, native plants, uh, and you can see the lovely image of the aloe up the side. And so it's, the organized by, um, it's organized by groups of plants as well as the conditions that they need to grow in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were cultivating them and making more and more varieties that were then pumped out into circulation of the rising merchant class. But this posed a, a problem in a sense because so many plants were coming back to Europe that people were giving them all different names. So the need for a classification and a naming system was important. And many people may know uh, Carolus Linnaeus, that name is very familiar, I think, to most people as the person who came up with our scientific nomenclature, um, the uh, method of giving plants a genus and a species name, and not only plants, eventually all living organisms. This is very much uh, an 18th century way and a scientific exploration of uh, measuring and quantifying and um, kind of t organizing the world um, so we can make sense of it and analyze it. Absolutely. And uh, what was needed was to be able, in order to do that, was to be able to group things so that you could give them a name, but you could also find similar things that would go together. So on the right, you can see uh, this chart that is of the stamens of plants, the, the male part of the plant, 
it's very characteristic that the sexual classification system that Linnaeus uh, came up with was based on the male parts of the plant. And there are lovely uh, exposés about the nuptial bed and, and the, the sexuality of, the, of these plants, which was again very much a part of the time. And the, uh, what was important about the reason Linnaeus's system was the one that became the most prominent and accepted, at least for a time, was um, that it was all just based on flowers rather than have flowers and uh, fruit and other parts all at the same time. So that he, he sort of normalized a, um, a sexually based classification um, that everyone adopted. So basically you can share knowledge and information and, and add to it in a way that um, is more kind of global or puts things together in a way that you can really scientific sharing, right? Absolutely. And what also helped with this scientific sharing was the fact that, that it was becoming easier and easier to do print publications. Mm -hmm. And many of the uh, prominent uh, landowners would want people to come mm -hmm. in and do a catalog, which was called a Florilegia, of their, um, of their plants and things that were, were growing in their garden. And Hortus Cliffordianus was done by Linnaeus and his uh, colleague, George Dionysius Arret, who we see here, who was one of the premier equally important botanical illustrators. So you had this marrying of the scientific uh, classification of plants with depicting them in a way that people could see them. Because remember, when they would come back, they'd be pressed and dried and dead. And I've always said, pressed and dried and dead isn't sexy. Uh, so <laughs> they uh even though it's a sexual system so the the illustrators were equally important in disseminating this and this they were really important because uh i mean they make them look so ravishing and these these uh prints are, are glorious but that's what people were really seeing more than the actual plant in all its glory um so being able to visualize it <clears throat> but you're saying in it in actually a, an anatomically correct way and what they would do is increasingly, so Linnaeus' system was in Latin. You can see on the left this book also on display. So we have these wonderful books on loan from the Thomas Fisher Library. Um, and on the left, you see illustrations from John Miller's interpretation of Linnaeus. So everybody was trying to get this information out so that it was not only specialists, but it was in the hands of this rising merchant class and the rising elite, because at this time it was very, very fashionable to be part of a society, to be part of some kind of academic pursuit. And the magazine on the right is an actual botanical magazine that was founded in in uh, 1787 and continued right up to 1983. It's really um, interesting. So this is the sort of um, circulation of flowers into more kind of mass culture um, and making them uh, accessible uh, for, for a lot of people. Um, but at the same time too, it's what was happening with fashion and this whole print culture that was going along cheaper uh, paper um, more circulation. So fashion plates really started by the end of the 17th century and by the 18th century um, were available, these small series by subscription. Um, and uh, so this is this is all coming together of sharing this, this information and having a kind of um, quite a broad general knowledge that um, intersects as a, as a cultural knowledge. So how Alex did the interest in flowers and things translate into what was happening in fashion uh, and did it have any influence on men oh it, it was it was the key I, I cannot imagine um, historical dress or even contemporary dress without uh, flowers or floral references um, and you certainly can't get colors and textiles without natural dyes which come from flowers and, and spices and, and plants and roots so it's absolutely literally um, integrated into the body of the fabric. Um, 
<clears throat> and certainly for men who were the collectors very much, they were the men who had the wealth, they were the people who, the merchants who were supporting the expeditions and bringing things back. So your um, uh, East India Company people um, <clears throat> having huge status and, and kind of glomming the good goods uh, as they come in. So being able to physically wear them and show your connoisseurship, your expertise, your links to this um, was obviously very visible if you applied it to your dress. So it was applied on menswear, um, <clears throat> in embroidery, in these fantastic things that came in from India and from dusk till dawn. So this uh, robe that's on display in the exhibition, uh, an Indian imported gown that was made for European consumption, um, was an informal, what we call today as a dressing gown, informal robe that was worn in the privacy of your own home. Um, <clears throat> and that was a luxury good. And it was a sign of uh, an elite man, of a, a, a scholar, a, a connoisseur um, because in this robe he would be relaxing and um, releasing his mind as he released his body in more comfortable clothes and working in his study and there's many many portraits of men um, painted expensive paintings privately commissioned um, wearing these gowns showing um, their expertise their status their wealth in their um, studios or in their in their studies and this wonderful print from the late 17th century showing um, a man in his splendor and they were worn without the jacket so they were informal they were worn off, often with slippers and they were worn without the heavy wig so they were more comfortable and they were looser um, and in in this print this man is definitely wearing an imported um, cotton uh, chintz gown and in our one on display um, and we have three beautiful imported Indian ones that were made specifically for European taste and you can see that very clearly in a detail of the, the one we just looked at um, in the red colour which was uh, unknown in Europe how you could get that intense red that came uh, often from, from um, uh, Madder or the Meyerblind plant um, <clears throat> And in this case, you see a, you see an, an English rose. Would it be English? Yes, it would be an English rose. Roses were something that were very timeless. And I think we've discussed before how one of the beauties of the banyan was that it was a timeless gar garment. And the rose was also <laughs> a timeless decoration. It was one that we don't know of the exact origin of the cultivated rose, but we know that by this time they were um, cultivating many, many different varieties throughout Europe. And um, so the, and, and there were many collections of roses. Uh, Josephine um, Bonaparte was one who had a huge collection of roses that was painted by the artist uh, Pierre Joseph Redote. Um, in this one, we can see the details and how you've got, you've got several different clusters that are going up a vine and um, we have uh, sprays of other kinds of flowers, probably including um, in, including cherries and other things. Those, uh, those sprays are, are a great example of this kind of um, fusion or compilation sampling um, from your beautiful botanical books and, and drawings and um, uh, sketching to really put something together that's a complete fantasy but makes really good design and um brings it together so i don't know there's probably like three or four different um plants um shoved into one new plant <laughs> In, into plant one little tiny together. thing but on other garments um they would do other things and i'm remembering back to this beautiful uh man's vest which was <laughs> one of the first ones that you and i worked on together mm -hmm. um a little bit about it. Oh, this is a fantastic uh, second quarter of the 18th century, beautiful man's waistcoat. Um, this is half of it. We do have the other half and it would have been worn underneath a, a, a coat. Um, <clears throat> and it was meant to be seen because it's splendidly and lavishly embroidered by professional embroider with unbelievably luscious um, flowers. And here you have another example of the rose again. Um, so the circulation of these patterns from these prints um, for embroidery for many centuries um, had been going around 
um, and looking actually in your garden if you had things, but then sending those ideas off to India and then bringing it back in the man's banyan in an in a Indian um, designed and, um, and, and put together garment um, really begins this kind of mass circulation of, of global ideas and exchange of, of knowledge that's both technical in terms of how you make things, um, which they were desperate to understand in Europe, how the Indians could really produce these wonderful things, um, as well as imagery. And it was going, it was going full circle all the way around. One of the things that I remember about this fest as well is that I, I can remember thinking that it was almost a testament to the movement of plants, because of course, things were also moving very rapidly between the Americas and, uh, and Europe at this time. And you have things like dogwoods and magnolias on this vest that uh, were coming from that. So you have this trade element that is coming into what you were wearing and is very much affecting the designs. Mm -hmm. So And designs, uh, designs were seasonal too. I mean, this is the beginning of our, the 18th century is the beginning of our idea that continues today of seasonal fashion that you know you wear different kinds of clothes for different seasons and um, understanding plants and understanding the meaning of plants and what would be in bloom uh, at a certain time um, would be when you would wear that so it's a way of marketing which it still is and always works um, as well as connoisseurship. So, uh, you know, you don't want to be caught out wearing a, a spring flower in the fall or in the winter. I mean, that's just not appropriate. Um, so it's, it's encouraging trade, it's encouraging um, consumption, um, but it's based on a, on a cultural understanding and on a, his, on a real uh, scientific understanding of, of, of what's happening in the world and, and in your garden. And, you know, as you know, it's it's magical to to see the first flowers in bloom in, in your garden. Um, Absolutely. And so this was um, this was men's fashion. What about women? Well, men were the leaders in fashion because they had the most dosh and they were obviously more important than women. So they thought. Um, <clears throat> but women, you, you can, again, you can't imagine uh, women's dress without uh, floral imagery on it. And um, uh, women were also considered to be better at um, with sort of manual dexterity. So they're often the floral painters for ceramics and um, were encouraged to be watercolor artists in their own right, whether that was professional or just as a evidence of being a, a good educated wife. Um, and we, in one instance in the uh, Roms collection, we know actually who wore the dress, which is very, very nice. Um, so this lady, Mary Winifred Poulin, which you see on the left um, as a young woman and on the right as a married woman with uh, triumphant with her first child, of which she had many. Um, <clears throat> and she married um, uh, Walter Spencer Stanhope of Cannon Hall um, in 1783. And we know that, uh, and here this is the, the house that she moved to and that he inherited. And you can see it has this pinery greenhouse um, uh, that would have been glassed in obviously at the time. And it was a very grand thing and, and absolutely speaks to your point of um, connoisseurship and the elite demonstrating and, and putting their money where their mouth is um, of having these wonderful hot houses and, and ways of taming nature. And this is one of her gowns, a beautiful indigo, um, cotton gown made in the textile made in India, the gown actually made for her in London, which we know because there's uh, writings from her chaperone, Miss Pradis, um, telling her what she's getting um, for her trousseau, um, which included several um, delicate flowered morning gowns. And this is one of them that she would have worn and that is really uh, ravishing. And she obviously did wear it because we can tell that the um, textile has been well used, which is a good sign, I think, because she loved it. And, um, <clears throat> and it's uh, beautifully fitted and tailored in the bodice um, for her in the latest fashion at the end of the century um, that emulates menswear and, and is for, for day clothes and women doing things like you could imagine her going to the, the garden and the pinery in this wonderful dress. Absolutely, and especially a dress that is covered in carnations or the Venus Dianthus, um, which is very easy to recognize. It's one of the 
very frequently used flowers on all kinds of textiles from all sorts of different cultures um, and is distinct for its uh, for its very uh, heavily toothed uh, edges to the petals that you can see and they stand upright on a very tall receptacle. Uh, so it's a very easy one and, and was reused in many, many different shapes and forms for mm -hmm. many countries. Um, so Alex, once the things that we've looked at, some of the fashion pieces we've looked at have been um, Indian painted cottons or Indian chintz, um, but what happened after? We know that after a time, uh, the Europeans were desperate to be able to uh, control uh, the production themselves and to be able to reproduce these colors and things. Um, what happened? Did the floral designs and things continue? Oh, the florals definitely continued. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it's just a, a treasure trove and they can be large and small and um, intimate and grand. So uh, Oberkampf uh, was a in Alsace and he was a, a, a man who developed a, a manufactory for printed textiles and this was a time in Europe when um, many countries uh, had bans against these imports because they were threatening their um, own industries whether that was linen or, or wool or, or silk industries um, because people wanted the latest things which were imported and, and uh, not made locally. So until Europe could really understand how to basically emulate the Indian textiles, how to manipulate dye, how to control color, how to keep it in place, um, how to have these beautiful white grounds, which were something that was very important, which was astonishing in Europe because they were like um, the porcelains that, that were coming in from Asia. Um, <clears throat> so this clarity, it's like you're looking at a printed page, but you're wearing it. It was really astonishing. Um, so Oberkamp's manufacturing was very important and Philip Sykes, um, a scholar who was a Jervis Fellow who lives in England and who's contributed to the exhibition in the catalogue, um, as you know, has done fantastic work um, on, on printed textiles, it's his expertise, but um, particularly on this one. So he's looked at many sources. And the one that um, he has given us here and, and discusses in the catalog is a reference to um, Jean Lamarck's Encyclopédie Méthodique Botanique, which was published uh, in between 1791 and 1794. And you can see the um, engraving at the bottom. And if you look closely, you'll find that many of the plants that are on the textile are actually taken from that. And this is something that went on for many, many centuries. People don't realize that there was an exchange going between cultures, uh, even between the Mughals and the Europeans going back uh, to the 1700s and the 1600s. Uh, there was this exchange of information. So globalization is not something that has just recently started. And I love this piece because it has plants on it that are from Australia, are from uh, Africa, are from South America, are from Europe, and they're all mixed together. And it was this absolute uh, desire for things that were exotic and things, things that were bright and beautiful. Yes, and, and you know, this is where art, art and design and um, science really come together by using uh, these beautiful, as I think they're beautiful, botanical illustrations that give you hardcore information, but that you can um, really riff on in so many ways and um, produce this extraordinary textile that's an amalgamation of uh, flights of fancy, um, putting these things uh, together in a way that are very intriguing. You could actually spend a lot of time um, looking at your dress or having someone look at your dress and trying to um, unravel what's going on on it. Um, and, and, and understanding these things. So uh, this exchange is, is very important and um, it's always fun working with you, Deb, um, unraveling things and, and really trying to understand what was going on in history and what people were maybe thinking or trying to put together um, in a way that uh, <clears throat> is kind of open-ended because uh, certainly, you know, the best design isn't necessarily a scientific design. Um, but without that scientific knowledge and, and base, um, design would be very different, I think. And without 
the artistic interpretation of some of the science, it would not have gotten out and been spread so widely to the masses. And I think one of the things that um, Florals has done for me is really draw these things together and show that how um, art, nature, and culture are very intricately um, connected and we and also the the importance of these things the, the importance of having this personal relationship uh with nature as we express it through what we wear uh, mm -hmm. and also through what we have in our homes um i recently heard a talk by an indigenous botanist who was um talking about how people are losing their ability to name the plants in their garden. They're, they're becoming unfamiliar. Yet we remember that, that all of these plants and, and flowers, just by our having them in the way we do and incorporating them to our, into our designs and into our life, are very, very precious. And it's been a real pr privilege to work with you, Alex, and, and learn more. I always learn more every time we speak. And uh, it's, it's great uh, to have had the chance to dig into this topic deeply. In well, the it's very fun and, and really the, the pleasure is, is the beautiful objects um, and having a real chance to, um, to sort of commune with them and think about them in a way that um, uh, is more than just a pretty dress. So thanks very much. And a beautiful book uh, <laughs> from a special time everybody in their own perspective. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. It's been great to talk to you today. Bye.